All right. Please take it away, Einer, and uh, take control of the screen. So stop. All right. I'm, I'm working. I'm getting there. All right. I see your screen now. This. That's good. I got to get rid of this little thing here. All right. Sorry, folks. We all know how it is. There we go. Okay. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Einer Jensen. I'm a risk reduction specialist with South Metro Fire Rescue. And I appreciate the Historical Society bringing me on board for another presentation this year. Uh, it's, it's really just more gravy, icing, and bonus points uh, to be able to hang out with fellow historians. Uh, just a couple of reminders for, uh, in case you missed the earlier presentation I did. I guess that might have been last month. Uh, I have two degrees in history, a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Puget Sound, a master's from the University of Montana. I've been here at South Metro Fire Rescue for the last 13 and a half years. And at the beginning of March, I'm actually marking a quarter of a century in the fire service. And over that whole time, I continue to be a student of fire. Even though we're talking about flooding tonight, uh, it's still, you know, still the fire department. Uh, that's the uh, primary book that I've written. So uh, you can do what you need to do there. And I'm a painter and I like hanging out with my daughters, uh, exploring our ecosystems, having big thoughts, big talks, that sort of thing. And uh, talking history as well. Their mom and I are both historians. So uh, they're certainly getting ingrained in the social studies world. And without further ado, let's get to disasters in history. And tonight, as most of you know, we're discussing the South Platte Basin flood from June of 1965. And quite frankly, I'm a little yeah, nervous isn't the right word, but I, I, for those of you who remember this flood, uh, I hope I do it justice. I, I don't remember this flood because that was, well, seven and a half years before I was around. Uh, but it's, it's always interesting for me to do these surveys or these case studies for events where people in the audience might have been there. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Anyway, I think that this uh, quotation from the U.S. Geological Survey's H.F. Mathai was a bit of an understatement. An outstanding hydrologic event occurred. Well, I guess that's just bureaucrat speak. But uh, anyway, I do want to mention real quickly that most of the photographs in the presentation, uh, they'll have that Getty Images Denver Post uh, stamp on them. That's because Getty Images and their uh, access to the Denver Post archive provided the best photos uh, for this presentation. So I'm, as a good historian, I'm giving them full credit for that. So uh, disasters in history. Uh, as we all know, because we're all here, history rocks. And it's, a, it's like I said before, it's a, a chance for us to learn lessons from disasters or other emergencies in our past, either locally or across the state, across the nation, and someday I'm going to dip into world disasters. Ultimately, my job as a risk reduction specialist is to figure out what's causing people to get sick or injured or really just lose property or be scared, and hopefully I can change their awareness of those topics. And then you, my audience, you have the choice to change your behaviors, uh, change the conditions of where you live, uh, where you work, where you play, that sort of thing. That's what risk reduction is. It's all of us working together so that we can all be safer. Some of the past topics that I've covered include the uh, 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City, mm -hmm. nightclub fires back in the 40s. In fact, I'm doing that tomorrow and Wednesday. And the 1958 Our Lady of the Angels fire. And the one that you all heard from me last month, I guess it was, was the 1871 fires uh, that hit Chicago, Peshtigo, Wisconsin, and other parts of the nation. But this week, let's move on here. This week, the 1965 South Platte River Basin flood. And I highlighted basin because I, I, I'm focusing this presentation not on the entire South Platte River watershed, uh, more of the, the part of the basin or the part of the watershed that is upstream of the city of Denver. Because really, does anything matter downstream of Denver? No, I'm just kidding, sort of. So uh, I'd like to review some of the two of my favorite authors in terms of the psychology of risk. 
uh, Tally Chereau on the left and Nicholas Taleb on the right. Uh, Tally wrote a great book called The Optimism Bias, uh, which is based on her theory of the optimism bias, in which we as humans overestimate positive events occurring in our lives and underestimate negative events occurring in our lives, which makes my job as a risk reduction specialist rather awkward because when I talk to most audiences about risk, they it's hard for them to accept that risk because it, it, oh, it'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. That's how we're wired as humans. Otherwise, most of us probably wouldn't even leave our own homes. Scary world out there if you don't have the optimism bias in your favor. And then Nicholas Taleb wrote a book called, uh, or referring to black swans, which are events that occur and that we as humans don't necessarily respect the likelihood of. Uh, but when those events occur, they can be earth shattering, hopefully not literally, but metaphorically earth shattering events. They like, uh, like depression, great depressions, like uh, wars, like explosions, like floods. Because we as humans tend to learn from observations and experience, which means that if we haven't actually experienced that incident, it's hard for us to, uh, to believe that it could possibly happen. So uh, the example I used to give was that who could, before uh, June of 2012, it was hard for people in Colorado to believe that a wildfire could burn into a city. But in June of 2012, the Waldo Canyon fire ripped into the north end of Colorado Springs. Well, we, we fell back into that position of, well, okay, so it's happened before, but it's, it's, it'll never happen again. And lo and behold, December 30th, the Marshall Fire ripped into Superior and Louisville. So uh, the, again, that's a black swan event. We, of course, it's a possibility, but psychologically speaking, it's hard for we, the humans, to acknowledge that that's a possibility and therefore act on it. So black swans, optimism bias, it all kind of plays together in my mind. Now, when it comes to floods, we in Colorado, uh, we typically, at least in our part of Colorado, we typically experience one of two types of floods according to the US Geological Survey. We usually experience flash floods as opposed to more of what you'd see in the Midwest or in the, even in the Southeast after a hurricane where you have a river flood. River floods occur over a greater amount of time where you get slowly rising high water because other tributaries to that stream are, are overloaded and then all goes into the main channel and, and the stream rises and rises and suddenly you've got a town that's partially or completely underwater. Whereas at least for me growing up in Clear Creek County, the greater concern was the flash flood where a big rain event, lots of snow melt, maybe even a dam crumbling upstream could cause the water in mighty Clear Creek to uh, grow rapidly. And ultimately though, that the flash flood is uh, certainly powerful, but it could be, it would be more short lived, for example. So two types of floods. And I thought it was interesting that Flash floods are far more typical in our part of the nation or our part of the world. Uh, in other words, areas with dry climates and rocky terrain, because our ecosystem isn't necessarily, familiar is not the right word, but it's not, it doesn't absorb big water the way that the Midwest ecosystems do, or the way that the, the ecosystems up in the, the Pacific Northwest, for example, when I was going to college up there, uh, there were several river floods that I studied, but that was, a, again, it, that ground is usually, uh, it, it can absorb more water than, say, a flash flood area. Mm -hmm. Something else about uh, flooding background, I want us to think about measuring water flow, because I'm going to use the term CFS quite a bit in this presentation. CFS represents cubic feet per second, which is a way of measuring how much water is flowing. Now a cubic foot of water, that's uh, if you could put water in a box, it'd be 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. That holds roughly seven and a half gallons of water. And according to most of the rafting websites that I, that I researched, and I figured rafters would know water flow better than anybody, I, I thought it was interesting that a river in our area is considered to have high water levels when the CFS is 3,000 and above. So remember that in the back of your minds that uh, a river rafting guide 
thinks that a, a river that's running at about 3000 CFS is a, a pretty good ride. Now, another way to look at a cubic foot in terms of volume is approximately three basketballs. Now, if the basketball was actually in a box, if you bought a basketball in a box, it would be a little less than two, but because it's a, a sphere, it's a, the volume wise, it's about three basketballs in a cubic foot. So if you were to imagine, well, for example, on February 5th, when I was uh, making the finishing touches on this presentation, I checked some of the stream flows, uh, the streams that were involved in the 65 foot. Cherry Creek over near Parker was flowing at 7.3 cubic feet per second. So for every second, if you could visualize 21 and a fraction basketballs going down that channel, that's roughly how much water was flowing there. On that same day, East Plum Creek near Castle Rock was at seven CFS and Plum Creek uh, after West and East Plum Creek come together near yeah. Sedalia was at almost 16 CFS. Yeah. So very little water is flowing through these, these watersheds in, uh, in February. All right, so here's the Platte River watershed. As an environmental historian, I, I love maps like this. And in fact, when I was in graduate school, I just remembered I did a project for a, uh, a, a public history firm where we actually studied the North Platte watershed. But of course, today we're looking at the South Platte watershed, but uh, it's a beast. Now, between May 21st and June 13th in 1965, for those of you who were here, hopefully you remember that that was a wet time of year and it was a wet year, it was a, a wet year, wet spring, I guess is what I'm trying to say for our part of Colorado. Not necessarily all of Colorado, but certainly for the South Platte River watershed, it was a, it was a rather wet time. Daily accumulations of at least an inch at several sites south of Denver uh, on May 21st and June 3rd. On June 4th and June 5th, on each of those days, up to three inches fell south of Denver. Light rain continued for the next seven days. And in all, the three week totals at uh, Castle Rock, Cherry Creek Dam, Parker, and Greenland are all listed there on the slide. You can read those without me reading the slide to you. And what that means to me, not just as an environmental historian, but also as a Coloradan, is that our soils at that time in June of 65 were saturated. They really, they weren't built to hold anything more. They, they were soggy and any more water at that point could cause issues. Uh, now, moving our attention to the North a little bit, June 14th and June 15th of 1965, a big rainstorm occurred uh, between the Wyoming border and the South Platte River. And it was uh, basically a 30 mile stretch south of the Wyoming border between Greeley and Sterling. Now what that meant for us, or I shouldn't say us because I wasn't here, but what this meant for the residents south of Denver was very little. What it meant for the lower part of the South Platte watershed though, is that there was big water flowing through the tributaries into the South Platte River, uh, especially starting about Fort Morgan and then downstream through Brush and Sterling and Julesburg. The South Platte River at that point was, after June 15th, was already running high and running fast because of the rainstorms on the 14th and 15th. And I'm sure if you lived in Julesburg at the time, maybe you were thinking, gosh, I, I, hope, this, I hope this is the end of it. But as you all know, because uh, of the title of the presentation, that wasn't the end of it. And uh, as you notice here, I, it's laziness, really. Uh, SPR is going to stand for South Platte River going forward. So on June 16th, 1965, here's our image of Douglas County. And I'm sure some of you uh, live in Arapahoe County, Jefferson County. Uh, I hope you do, because Highlands Ranch history spans more than just Douglas County. Anyway, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your, well, anyway, tell someone. So, uh, just a map of Douglas County to, to just kind of to situate ourselves because it's easy to forget about the rest of Douglas County, I guess is what I'm saying. So on June 16th, there was an upslope condition basically. Cool air had pooled the loft above the front range in Douglas County. 
uh, southeasterly winds were coming from the Gulf, uh, crossing over Texas, Oklahoma, a little bit of New Mexico up into Colorado, and all those areas were getting their share of rain as well. And as, the, as this stream of wet air reached Douglas County, it hit the Rampart Range, as well as a few other uh, topographical bumps in Douglas County. And that air moved upward. And as the air was moving upward, and it was warmer air from the Gulf, so as we all know, warm air rises. As that warm, moist air was rising upward into the cooler air, the moisture then condensed out of the air and started to do its thing, condensing into clouds and then into rain. And ultimately, that wasn't just in Douglas County, but uh, all, you know, from Denver to Pueblo, there were rainstorms that day. Now, the morning of June 16th, 1965, from my research, uh, was that it was a pleasant morning. It was just an early or late spring, early summer morning. No big deal. But then the, the weather changed. And I mean, of course, we're in Colorado. We know the weather's going to change. Uh, at 1 p.m., a tornado was spotted on the ground 15 miles southeast of Denver. Now, I didn't do the research here, but... Uh, I'm guessing that that was uh, what we would now consider Southwestern Aurora. And then at 1.30 p.m., a tornado took off some roofing down on Palmer Lake. So even by 1.30 in the afternoon, the weather was starting to get uh, sporty is the term that uh, I've been hearing uh, used quite a bit now. Sporty, sassy, certainly more interesting. This is a map from the US Geological Survey showing rainfall on June 16th. The, uh, as the guide on the right says, the, the green colors, the yellow colors, that's where the, the most rain fell. And then the bluer colors is where the least rain fell. Uh, but notice that Douglas County hosted a lot of rain, a ton of rain. So uh, Longfellow's quote, into each life some rain must fall, in Douglas County, they certainly knew that. They understood that on June 16th, 1965. All right, so let's get situated here. I'm a map junkie, as you can probably already tell, unless I've already told you that as well. If you follow my cursor here, we've got West Plum Creek. So this is south of Sedalia. This is West Plum Creek as it follows Jackson 105. Then we've got East Plum Creek, which again bridges off from Sedalia and goes through the Castle Rock area follows what we now call Interstate 25 down to Larkspur before it turns west into the Rampart Range. Cherry Creek is over yonder. It's over here. Uh, this area here is Castlewood Canyon, as it turns out, Castlewood Canyon State Park. Franktown is up in this area, the metropolis of Franktown. Rampart Range, that's the our part of the, well, it's not the Front Range, I guess. Front Range north is north of there, but this is the Rampart Range, the the foothills for this part of the Rockies. And then we have these two topographical bumps. We've got Dawson Butte and we've got Raspberry Butte or Raspberry Mountain. And those are all gonna come into play in the, the next part of the, or the rest of the presentation, I should say. And if I remember correctly, we're gonna start with the part of the flood that affected Cherry Creek, and then we'll come back over to West Plum Creek and East Plum Creek. All right, so this is a, a map of the Cherry Creek Basin. Uh, I, I warned you, I told you I was a map junkie. So the purple line is the outline of the basin. And then you can kind of see, hopefully you can see the, the dotted lines here, the, solid, the little bit of blue line, that's Cherry Creek. So on June 16th in the afternoon, rainstorms were hovering over the Franktown area, which is in this area here. The rainstorms just kind of hung out and drops three to six inches over that part of the watershed. So it was downstream of Castlewood Canyon, but uh, it would certainly had enough, it had plenty of space to do some damage. Now at 6.30 PM, Cherry Creek at Melvin, Melvin doesn't exist anymore, but it was roughly here where Cherry Creek encounters Arapaho Road. Cherry Creek was flowing at 39,900 CFS. So think back to those river guides where they're like, oh yeah, 3,000 CFS, that's a pretty active stream. So this was uh, 
uh, what is that? 13 times, coming up on 14 times a river rafting guides uh, fantasy river in the Southwest was flowing uh, right around the Arapaho Road area of the Cherry Creek drainage. Now, going back to 1933, the peak flow of the Cherry, of Cherry Creek after the Castlewood Dam failure, which would be another great disaster to look at, was 33,000 CFS. So this rainstorm created more water flowing through the Cherry Creek Channel than the Castlewood Dam failure. That's, that to me is impressive, both as an environmental historian and as a, a firefighter, as a well now retired firefighter. As Cherry Creek rolled into Cherry Creek Reservoir, the flow was roughly 59,000 CFS. That's a lot of basketballs, just saying. Cherry Creek Dam and Reservoir, fortunately, was in place in 1965. In fact, it was finished in 1950. It was a project by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to, well, mitigate floods. And it turns out it worked. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but uh, I love this view of Cherry Creek. Now, this is uh, not necessarily current. I, I don't even remember when this photo was taken, but it seems like there's a little bit more. There should be a little bit more going on there. But anyway. Earthen Dam, 141 feet tall, 14,300 feet long. Think about that. It's length, 14,000 feet long. We know other things that are 14,000 feet tall in this state, but I'm just saying. And it was constructed for flood control. And it worked, like I say. So uh, another, another comment about water. We tend to measure water in lakes and reservoirs in terms of acre feet. An acre foot is roughly, well, it says there, 325,851 gallons. That's not roughly, that's precise. Or roughly an eight lane swimming pool, measuring 82 feet by 52 feet by 9.8 feet deep. So on June 16th, Cherry Creek Reservoir, uh, June, the evening of June 16th, I would even say, let's look at this at June 15th. The reservoir held 810 acre feet of water. That's typically what it held. So 810 eight lane swimming pools, roughly 264 million gallons. Less than 24 hours later, June 17th, about 5 p.m., it now was holding 14,770 feet of water, but it worked. There was zero flooding downstream of the Cherry Creek Dam, which, uh, I mean, that's impressive. I'm just saying, that's impressive. I'm going to show you some photos of the flooding upstream of the dam, since there are no photos to show you of crazy things happening downstream of the dam. Uh, and again, these, unless it's noted otherwise, these photos are from Getty Images from their website, and uh, Getty pulled them from the Denver Post Archives. So this is one of the crossings on South Cherry Creek. There's uh, some property that was along South Parker Road showing the damage after the flood. Uh, back in the day, I, can you imagine a time when there would be a disaster and there wasn't thousands of people with their cell phones taking photos and videos and posting them all over the place and then suddenly it's around the world and it on a you know snap like that? Ah, crazy stuff. Anyway, I digress. Here's a farm uh, that was along South Parker Road. Uh, south of the dam, but north of what was then the small wee burg of Parker. And again, south of Cherry Creek Reservoir. All right. So meanwhile, to the west, we've got Cherry Creek doing its thing over here uh, between Franktown and uh, Parker and then up to Cherry Creek Reservoir. At the same time as that iso hiatal map I think I pronounced that correctly, showed us there was rain not just flowing east, it was also flow, it was also hitting the ground and flowing west and all around Dawson Butte, all around Raspberry Butte, and making Plum Creek rather sporty as well. So the Plum Creek Basin, the deluge begins about 2 p.m. and it really targeted those two topographical bumps. I don't mean that in this disparaging way, but I'm a Clear Creek County kid. I'm used to taller mountains. 
But in this case, these two buttes were enough of a disruption to the, the southeasterly flow of warm, wet air coming from the southeast that they created uh, localized thunderstorms that really made a difference. So that afternoon of June 16th, Larkspur picked up 14 inches of rain. I mean, that's like rainforest amounts of rain. Castle Rock picked up a foot of rain in the same period. As the USGS recalled later, creeks overflowed, roads became rivers and fields became lakes, all in a matter of minutes. This was flash flooding. This photo here on the right shows a raspberry view afterward. It shows uh, a lot of the, the dendritic flow uh, or uh, of silt and and uh, soil that came down off the top of the mountain. You see the channels up on the sides of the mountain there and everything that was dumped off in the meadows and the, the uh, pastures. I mean, that was uh, just coming down off the mountain. That was an impressive flood event. The channels of East Plum Creek and West Plum Creek filled with water, trees, livestock, boulders, vehicles, equipment, and of course it was mud R us. So the Plum Creek Basin, the Plum, so Plum Creek is what we see from what is now Chatfield Reservoir south to Sedalia. And in Sedalia, that's where Plum Creek uh, branches, the east version goes off into or through Castle Rock, the west version continues down Highway 105. Uh, East Plum Creek, just below Castle Rock, is cresting at 126,000 CFS, which again is a lot of basketballs. West Plum Creek was just kind of its little mild cousin or mild sibling off to the west there at only, in quotes, 36,800 CFS. When those two streams came together to form Plum Creek itself, then we're talking even more water, of course. Simple math, 154,000 CFS. Uh, and the flood wiped out the gauge at Levere's, but eyewitness statements show that Plum Creek changed from a flow of 150 CFS to, like I say, 154,000. And that happened in three hours. So if you witness this, this is not something that you would I would guess that you would be able to push out of your brain very easily. Up in Clear Creek County, where I'm from, we didn't have floods like this. We would have high water uh, from snowmelt. We would we had some rainstorms. Certainly, in it was the summer of 1990. Oh, maybe it was 97. We had some big flooding in Georgetown that I was part of, uh, but nothing like this. Oh, and by the way, the prior peak of this stream, the the prior record flow of Plum Creek was a mere 7,700 CFS. And that was recorded back in 1945. So, uh, wow. Local impact. Castle Rock was inundated. I have a feeling Castle Rock looks like some of those Midwestern cities that we see today. Sedalia, uh, I don't remember where I found this little uh, note, but Sedalia itself took a major hit which makes sense because it had to deal with both branches of Plum Creek coming together. Uh, Lower Main Street was lost at Grange Hall. This man lived in Sedalia. He lost everything except what he was wearing, which reminded me, of course, of the Marshall Fire, where some people evacuated and they didn't have time to grab anything. And again, this, this, I included this photograph, not because I know him or another woman hugging him. I don't have connections to Sedalia directly. But it's important that when we study these disasters, these emergencies, these incidents in our past, it's to me, it's important that we remember the human element. So at the end of the presentation, if any of you want to share your own recollections, I, in addition to questions, I, I hope you do that because I, it's the human element that makes, to me, that makes history, even environmental history, so fascinating. So it was a northbound flood. The flood crested, excuse me, the flood crest traveled 15 miles from Leveris to Littleton in about two and a half hours. So when I think of flash floods in my mind, I still think about a wall of water, but it wasn't a wall of water. It's not Hollywood. It's, it's water rapidly rising, but then maintaining that, that higher level or that, that greater depth for 
several hours. And we got to remember that Chatfield Reservoir and Chatfield Dam are not in play in 1965. We'll talk more about those places later. But as the flood ran from Levere's to Littleton, it did drop down in its uh, CFS because, well, because the ecosystem did what the ecosystem was is supposed to do. It absorbed some of that water. It let the, the volume and the, gosh, the flow, the pressure spread out over a greater area. So instead of being in a tight channel, like, the, like Plum Creek is in Levere's, it was able to spread out more. But still, 110,000 CFS, it was still pretty impressive. I did find this uh, little note here, the third bullet point. I found it on a, it was the Mile High Foundation or Denver Waters website, one of those two. In 1965, the demand for Denver water for 508, or uh, I'll just read this slide. In 1965, 110,000 CFS for 24 hours would have supplied Denver Water's demand for 580 days. That's a lot of water, my friends. All right, so here's some more uh, pictures, again, from Getty Images. Uh, on the right, we've got the bridge to the Martin Company uh, showing it's about to fail. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, the Martin Company, is does he mean Lockheed Martin? Yeah. That's exactly right. That was one of the early versions, one of the, some of the first buildings uh, from what we would now call Lockheed Martin. And then uh, on the left there, you can see the oxbows, the, the way the, the South Platte River wound, you know, back and forth and back and forth. I get it. In terms of development, that wipes out a lot of land that maybe can be developed, but those oxbows absorb floods. So here we have the ecosystem absorbing the flood water, just like the ecosystem would say, that's what we're supposed to do. The impact on Littleton uh, in some places was severe and in other places was more severe. <laughs> so here's a, a neighborhood that was at Bulls and Santa Fe on the left. Uh, another image here that according to the Denver Post, this was taken at uh, where Oxford crosses the South Platte River. But honestly, that that looks, to me, that looks more like some of those buildings that are on uh, north of what we would now call the Woolhurst neighborhood, but south of where Breckenridge Brewery sits. I was out there doing a, a survey for wildfire risk, and it seems like I saw that view on several occasions. But anyway, without the debris, but those buildings. But, you know, and it, no sense arguing. I, can't, I don't have enough evidence. Uh, Centennial Racetrack had water damage and the Ashton Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad, one of the earlier versions of what we now call Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Of course, uh, clearance is not 10 feet on that day. So after the flood reached Littleton, the flood, the, the flood crest then continued 11 more miles to the city of Denver, and it took about five hours to get down there. Previously, uh, in recorded history, which of course is not all history, it's just recorded history, between 1889 and 1965, the peak flow of the South Platte River in Denver was 22,000 CFS. But on June 16th, that cranked up to 40,300 cubic feet per second. And remember, it would have been far far worse, more volume, more flow, had Cherry Creek Reservoir and the dam not held back that flood that was coming out of the Cherry Creek Basin. So the South Platte River, it was already icky prior to this flood. There was really no rules. Uh, the, EP, the Environmental Protection Agency didn't exist. There was so much raw sewage being pumped into the South Platte River starting at about Littleton. There, there was runoff of all kinds that uh, landfills weren't really capped off like they are today. There was, there was junk galore all over this, this river, the, the side the embankments of the river as it was. But now with this flood, anything that was buoyant and loose between, well, between Raspberry Mountain and Denver was now in the channel. So, uh, Butane gas storage tanks, 
house trailers, lumber, vehicles, run off from landfills, run off from the roads, every, you know, stuff that people had in their yards. Uh, this was not just a water disaster. This was a pollution disaster. I don't know that that's what the thought process was initially back in 1965. That's certainly a benefit of, it's kind of, a, it's my hindsight because I'm a, a kid of the post EPA area, the post clean air, clean water act era. It's, it's part of our changing ethics or land ethic, I guess, but imagine the ickiness of this flood. Some bridges held, some collapsed. I remember when I was younger, my mom, who was living in Wheat Ridge back then, she was a she, she was no longer a teenager. She was in her early 20s. So uh, June, she would have been home from going to college. She remembers so many of the bridges across the South Platte uh, collapsing or not being usable uh, when she was, like I say, when she was in uh, Wheat Ridge in 1965. On the left, we've got uh, one of the bridges over the South Platte River. This was uh, Hamden uh, Highway 285, a photo from the Sheridan Historical Society, that one collapsed, but several other bridges just became uh, catch basins, if you will, for lots of the debris that was floating down the river. But the police officers of the time were blocking traffic because they didn't know if the bridges were going to hold. When the South Platte River reached Denver, it slammed into the bottoms area, which we would now call Auraria. And the rail yards were still there back then. So you can see a lot of the water collecting, uh, the, imagine the damage happening in the rail yards. Uh, and it, the damage to the railroads wasn't just in the rail yards. Uh, Denver and Rio Grande Western reported losing five bridges and four miles of track and about $500,000 in infrastructural damage alone. And the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad, they didn't lose any track in the event. They lost some culverts, but they did have to repair a bridge uh, and that bridge repair cost uh, half a million dollars. Downstream of Denver. So we'll talk a little bit about downstream of Denver. So Bijou and Kiowa Creeks, which drain uh, Elbert County and Arapahoe County, they also caught heavy rain, and, but they flowed into the South Platte downstream of Denver. So we had the Plum Creek Basin, Cherry Creek, well, Cherry Creek was taken care of. We had the Plum Creek Basin, Bijou Basin, Kiowa Basin, all flowing into the South Platte River. And as the South Platte River then turned and followed what we now call uh, high, or Interstate 76, when it reached Fort Morgan, it reached an area that was already saturated. And so the upriver flow compounded into the, the downriver flow. And there was even more flooding going down toward Julesburg until the South Platte hit the North Platte. And then things could even out in Nebraska because Nebraska is just one in that area, one ginormous floodplain. And that's not a dig on Nebraska. That's just what Nebraska is at that point. So the flood stretched 300 miles. That's really what we're looking at, a 300 mile flood from uh, the, what was that, Grand Island there in Nebraska, all the way up to the headwaters in the Rampart Range. Now, fortunately, this flood did not involve the South Platte as it goes up into Waterton Canyon, because the rain didn't reach Waterton Canyon, fortunately. Uh, had it reached Waterton Canyon, then it would have uh, would have combined with the snow melt coming off of those mountains, and it could have been even worse. Now, this photograph here is actually uh, along the East Plum Creek drainage. Uh, it's the highway going into Castle Rock. You can kind of see some of the Castle Rock topography there in the back background. The because so many bridges were wiped out, even just in Douglas County. Traffic stopped. I mean, of course, we're familiar with this scene today. Uh, every weekend coming, uh, you know, northbound, at least going back into Castle Rock, even after the Gap Project. But this was not just a local disaster. This was a regional disaster. 
So let's look at uh, the flood's impact overall. This was this was Sixth Avenue. Uh, looking west, I believe. I, I believe we're looking at the uh, the the bridge for Federal there, and then uh, so Sixth Avenue looking west, where the Valley Highway. Is that cool? The Valley Highway I twenty five. Anyway, uh, so twenty one people died, three hundred million dollars in damage just in the city of Denver, two hundred eight million dollars in damages outside the city of Denver, including our area, Littleton, Douglas County. Pastures were packed full of debris, no longer packed with livestock because a lot of those unlucky livestock died in the flood and they were washed downstream. Roads destroyed, bridges destroyed, and the debris was everywhere. Uh, lots of wreckage, junk, mud, something that I didn't find in the research, but I'm familiar with from other floods uh, that I've researched, either when I was in college up in Tacoma or uh, hearing about floods, of course, in other parts of the country not the least of which would of course be the September 2013 floods in here in Colorado, mold. Uh, there's no real research into the level, the amount of mold that was left behind in homes uh, and what the, uh, the mitigation, not the mitigation, the, the restoration costs were for getting mud and mold out of homes and structures, that sort of thing. Even though Colorado is that, yeah, I get it, a dry climate, we still get mold. So yeah, like the U.S. Geological Survey said, the South Platte River Valley was a mess. So after the flood, local after the flood, Chatfield Dam and Reservoir were built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That uh, project, project, easy for me to say, lasted from 1967 to 1975. There's a great photo, again, from many years ago uh, that it looks a little different now uh, of uh, Chatfield Dam and Reservoir. Chatfield, uh, the dam is 13,000 feet long, 147 feet high. The water is currently usually 59 feet deep. I adjusted for the recent uh, expansion of Chatfield that occurred just in the last couple of years. The reservoir has a storage, uh, conservation storage capacity of 47,600 acre feet. But in terms of a flood, it can actually hold 350,000 acre feet. My office is at a fire station just on the west side of Chatfield over in Trailmark. And if, you know, all things being equal, I'll just take their word for it. I don't want to be there when it has to hold 350,000 acre feet of water. Just saying. Another local thing after the flood, Littleton Fire Rescue, Littleton Fire Department at the time, both of their stations were east of the South Platte River, even though part of the fire protection district stretched on the west side of the South Platte River. So this flood actually was the impetus for Littleton Fire Department to build what was then Station 3, uh, then became Station 13, and now is considered South Metro Fire Rescue Station 13 uh, out on uh, coal mine. If you are interested in learning more about Station 13, our public information officers recently did one of our station Saturday videos about that station. And I'll, I will post this link in the chat box uh, when I'm done with the presentation. But it's a cool little insider's tour of uh, the station that we named for Colonel Paul Wolf. So more after the flood, local. In 1969, the state legislature uh, created the Urban Drainage and Flood Control District, which remarkably is all about controlling flood and urban or drainage in urban areas. So it's really that it was the first time across the nation that a, a special district was coordinating floodplain management over multiple counties and cities. Uh, the Denver Urban Renewal Authority urged voters to transform the bottoms area, which is now known as Auraria, into what is now known as Auraria. Uh, and it, I don't know if you guys, uh, Remember, I think it was last year, there were some stories that the, the owners, the managers, whatever, of the Auraria campus area, they're still working with the former residents of the Bottoms to uh, kind of compensate them for the loss of land and loss of identity. And this flood also inspired the revitalization of the SPR corridor. 
uh, that spans several mayors down in Denver, uh, McNichols, Pena, Webb, uh, and you know, when you talk about Elitch's uh, next month, it might be interesting if they, uh, if that speaker refers to the flood and and how that led to the move of Elitch's to that, I mean, amazing, amazing property where it's now at along the South Platte. It'll be interesting to see what happens to it next. So lessons, lessons for all of us. Yeah, flooding can certainly be a spectator sport. And these were people watching the South Platte River, the uh, huge South Platte River, uh, following June 16th, 1965. Uh, they're standing on an embankment or a little hillside there down on South Santa Fe. Now it can be a spectator sport, but I appreciate that they are they are standing away from the side of the river. If I can, if you'll indulge me briefly here. Uh, September 2013, that's when the floods were raging. We had that big long-term rainstorm up and down the front range uh, in our part of Colorado. Uh, the big Thompson flooded, St. Brain flooded, flooded, Cache La Poudre flooded. Basically every watershed from the Wyoming border south to Bear Creek uh, experienced flooding, including my home watershed of Clear Creek. Uh, and Clear Creek contributed one of the few fatalities to that flood. A friend of mine, an older man named uh, Carol White, was allegedly standing on the side of Clear Creek down at the southern, excuse me, the eastern end of Idaho Springs, watching the floodwaters. Uh, when the embankment gave way, he fell into the water and uh, his body was found down in Clear Creek Canyon several days later. So, Yes, I get it. Flooding is certainly a spectator sport, but be careful out there, folks. So another lessons learned, another lesson learned, I should say. Do you need flood insurance? Uh, recently, those of us in, at South Metro Fire Rescue and other fire departments, we've been reminding homeowners to check their insurance policies regarding wildfire. Uh, but this is also a great reminder about flood insurance because most policies don't cover floods automatically. So if you have any doubt about whether you live in a floodplain, you can go to the FEMA website or the National Flood Insurance website and check out their maps. And believe me that the, uh, the maps that are online can be rather overwhelming, but you get down to your address and you can figure out if your address is in a floodplain. And I just grabbed this little excerpt here. This is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this shows you can see Santa Fe, there's a little red mark up here. Uh, that's station 16, South Metro Fire Rescue Station 16. This is the Windcrest area. Uh, and this area here, zone A, that is a place for uh, horses currently. It's just a wide open plain full of grass. It was created to be a flood catchment zone. Uh, at, when I was first out there, I asked one of the residents, is this for Chatfield? And they're like, no, actually, this is the catch water so it doesn't wipe out Chatfield. So if you live in that area, it's probably a good idea to have flood insurance. Uh, of course, please register for your accounts for Douglas counties and our, most of our cases, uh, reverse notification system. If you don't live in Highlands Ranch or you have family who lives somewhere else, uh, some cities have their own reverse notification systems as well. Uh, so register for that so you can be warned of flooding and other emergency events. If it's time to evacuate, evacuate immediately. Don't wait. Don't drive around barricades. Turns out we first responders, not me anymore, but our firefighters, law enforcement officers, they put those up for a reason. It's not just to control you. It's not some weird mind game. It's so that you don't get dead. And ultimately, it seems like a, if a barricade's up, respect it, go somewhere else. Listen to weather radio services or the local alerting systems for current emergency information. Uh, don't drive through floodwaters. Don't walk through them. Don't swim through them. It doesn't take much water to float or move a car. Turn around, don't drown. That's the national uh, the phrasing or the, the catchphrase. Turn around, don't drown. I certainly worked floods when I was a firefighter up in Clear Creek County. 
And there was always people who were like, no, I can totally handle this. And they usually couldn't. And then that would put responders' lives at risk. Uh, stay off bridges over fast moving water because you don't know what kind of damage is happening under the bridges. The, maybe the bridge is still standing, but maybe the, the damage, the structural damage you can't see, maybe the piers have been washed away or some of the, the, the supporting for the bridge has been washed away. Uh, and yeah, maybe this isn't so much of a risk on the, the rim of the metro area that most of us live on, either Lone Tree or Highlands Ranch, but we all travel. I'm guessing we all still travel. So maybe you're in the mountains, maybe you're in the Midwest, maybe you're somewhere else where flooding is a risk or more of a risk. These are all lessons that we can apply so that we can stay safe. Again, as you guys know, I consider myself at least a, a decent historian. So here's my bibliography. Uh, it's great resources online. Great resources on littletongov.org, by the way. This uh, Mathai, he wrote the report for the USGS. Great report, lots of good images in there. Prendergast wrote a couple of good things. Yeah. So I'm gonna put this survey link in the chat box here momentarily. I would like all of you to use, the, use that link to complete a brief survey. Let's see if you learned a few things, get some demographic information really just figure out more of who my audience is. So if I'm invited back to speak to this group, uh, I can know you a little, little bit more. Don't start bailing out yet. I just saw people leaving, stick around. So uh, future disasters and history presentations. There's my email address, email me and I'll put you on the list. Southmetro.org has safety information from your fire department. Otherwise I'm gonna switch out here and put some information in the chat box. Uh, give up my screen sharing ability somehow. Whoops, someone already did that. Good job. And uh, let me pull up. Yes, okay, thank you. Chat. All right, so uh, give me a second. I'm going to start putting some stuff over into chat. Stand by. Then I'll answer your questions. All right, well, why do you do that? I noticed the first question chat's actually not necessarily for you, but it's about the chance of having more future programs on Zoom. Uh, as we go in person, it's a little more challenging technically to do Zoom, uh, but we will uh, pay attention to that in the future. And we may have Zoom meetings occasionally, but for the most part, we are gonna focus on the in-person meetings. Have you been able to get the chat up? Uh, the next one is, I think, more for you, Einer. Okay, so I'm almost ready, stand by. Stand by. Everybody's being very patient. I appreciate that. No, actually, right. the next one's more of a comment. So, okay. All right. So, yeah. there's the video. I'm sorry. There's the video. There's the survey link. There's my email address. All right. So, now I'm ready. Uh, this is fantastic. Visit the Carson Nature Center. Oh, totally true. Why didn't I think of that? I should have gone over to the Carson Center as well. I know better. So uh, uh, Rolf, thanks for putting that up there. Definitely go to the Carson Nature Center. Uh, there's a lot of great information there about the ecosystem as well. So uh, good comment. Are there any estimates of what would have happened if Cherry Creek Dam didn't exist? There, Tony, there are estimates. I didn't include them in here because it seemed like it was hypothetical, but so the flood was, Cherry Creek was dumping into the reservoir at 59,000 CFS. Had that reached the South Platte, uh, I think when the South Platte hit Denver, it was, it was 40,000. So it would have been another, back up to about 100,000 CFS. So roughly what the flood was doing is it ripped into Littleton. Uh, given the number of people who were living in that area at the time, uh, downstream of what we, or downstream where the dam is, uh, lots more residential damage, we would have had thousands more homeless, and not exactly the, even back then, not exactly the most economically stable area. So I think that the, the poorer people there would have taken the brunt of that flood even uh, worse than the folks in Littleton, uh, Levere's, and uh, probably more on the scale of what happened in the bottoms in Denver. 
more questions. Come on, give me more than that. Okay. Let's say next one is more of a uh, one just of making sure that uh, seeing it, how many more events we can make available uh, on Zoom. So definitely a desire to have more events available via Zoom. All right, anyone who doesn't want to chat but wants to actually mention it, feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask your question directly. Otherwise, anyone who had stories, anyone who was around in 1965 and actually remembers this firsthand, please uh, share your stories also. Well, while we're, while we're waiting for people to raise their hand, DJ, would you mind just saying a word or two about the um, Chatfield Dam area uh, before it became the dam? Uh, because that was part or part of that area would belong to the Phipps, uh, you know, who owned, who owned Highlands Ranch. Uh, do you have any, any info on that for us? Yeah, I believe I heard that before that that area was or a significant portion of that area. I know there was also a little town in there, so not all of it, but at least a good portion of it was actually also owned by Phipps, who was the original owner of Highlands Ranch. And he actually gave it up to the Army Corps of Engineers for a nice tax break instead of selling it. He decided to donate for a tax break. And so that's how they got some of the land where they put Chatfield to kind of like you were saying, Cherry, I didn't realize Cherry Creek was already in place, but I'm glad to hear that it was and it is effective. And that's how they built Chatfield in very much the same fashion to protect from all the tributaries, uh, both Plum Creek and uh, the South Platte coming out of Waterton Canyon. It protects both of those from entering the city of Denver, air, proper area. I know um, I had spoken with um, Lawrence Phipps III, you know, the son of, of the owner, and he had mentioned that that area down there that's Chatfield Dam now used to be their hay field. And um, since they had a ranch, hay was rather important to the, to the horses. So it wasn't a, a, a thing that they wanted to give it up, but obviously there was a lot of pressure on them um, to give it up uh, after the after the uh, after the flood, um, and I believe that there was a lot of um, uh, probably more like eminent domain where they did some condemnation of, of properties, and uh, so a lot of I, I believe a lot of people were affected. The Hildebrands, and there's still a Hildebrandt farm in the uh, botanic gardens portion down there, and I think the Hildebrands fought it. So. It created a lot of a lot of problems, but my favorite part about it is when they were digging the dam. Apparently, they found some mammoth heads, mammoth skulls. So um, I like to think that we know that we had mammoths then on what would have been Highlands Ranch property, not just in in Lamb Spring. There's also a uh, there's at least one body underneath the Chatfield Dam, uh, according to. Uh, law enforcement sources. So pull the mammoths out and uh, drop, the, drop the human bodies in. That's awkward. Looks like there are some raised hands in there. Yep, I, I see some raised hands. I was gonna say, if you wanna just talk, just please unmute yourself. I don't, you should have the ability to unmute yourself. So I'm a docent at the Highlands Ranch Mansion. And we tell the story that the, um, the Corps of Engineers did come in and take the Phipps lands. And I remember the story, and I may be wrong, but even after Lawrence Phipps Jr.'s death, hit, their family was still fighting with the government as to what fair market value of the land that was taken was. Yeah, I, I could see that. I don't know the details of it, but that Seems like <laughs> I know some of those battles over fair market value can go on for decades. <laughs> I'm trying to get that stuff resolved. All right, looks like I know if you're watching chat, there's quite a few more uh, questions for you that popped up in chat. I'm addressing those questions as we go. One question was uh, ah. surprised that the Castlewood Dam release was uh, less than the Cherry Creek flowed in 1965. Uh, question about the, all the housing development uh, in the basins, uh, Cherry Creek or uh, 
Plum Creek basins, uh, what would that look like today? I mean, the, the damage would be astronomical. So uh, I don't know, I kind of want to hear what uh, Ed's got to say. And was that oh, Ms. Mullen okay. there? Yeah, I'll go ahead. I remember the flood very well. I worked at the Martin Company at that time, and I lived in West Lakewood uh, up about Kipling and Colfax. So it happened on a Thursday. And for me, it was just another day at work, and I drove home, and then I started watching TV in the evening. And the most vivid video I remember is you had one photo that showed about Bowles and Santa Fe, and there was a mobile home there. There was a large mobile home park right along the South Platte there, very close to the Centennial Racetrack. And on TV, you could watch the waters. We didn't know how bad it was at that time, slowly rising. And then those mobile homes starting to let loose and float and then float out of there. And that's what I remember, you know, watching it that evening. Then, of course, the next day, Friday, uh, there was no work. Well, for me, young, footloose and fancy free, I couldn't go east, uh, north or south. So I headed west in the mountains, had a great weekend. But the next uh, Monday, it was back to work as usual. For me on the west side, it was a straight shot, you know, down on the Martin Company. You showed a picture of a bridge there. Well, for those people who lived in Denver and worked at the Martin Company, as I recall, really on the entire South Platte through Denver, there was only one bridge that was really serviceable. So a lot of my fellow workers had to all funnel through that one bottleneck. And I remember one other number, if I've got it right, I think at one point, the water depth at Alameda and I-25 was 50 feet deep. <laughs> and I don't know if you have any figures on that, but uh, you know, anyway, I thought that was really an impressive number. And then of course, later on, uh, one of the secretaries in our department at the Martin Company, she had a little house right along the South Platte Flint Plain in Littleton, close to you know, Centennial Racetrack. And this is like uh, at least a week, maybe a couple of weeks later. And there was still um, limited access to that area controlled by the police. But how our department then had to go in and help her, you know, muck out her house. Like her basement was just filled with muck and we're removing all the damage and also stuff that floated into her yard, trying to clean up all the flood damage around her house. But it, that was basically my uh, recollections wow. of the flood. That's great. Thanks for sharing it. I, I didn't include photos uh, from the Getty archive or the Denver Post archives from the Alameda uh, I-25 or Hampton I-25 areas, but there are there's some impressive pictures, uh, photos from that uh, region as well. Great memory. So thanks for sharing that with us. All right. Anyone else who wants to share their memories of 1965 or have some questions? I was uh, 10 years old and uh, we lived in Lakewood. Uh, had six siblings. Parents loaded up the kids in the 65 Ford wagon and went down to Ruby Hill, watched the, watched the flood. Hmm. Of those 21 people that died, I believe there was a young man who would not get off of the Hampton Bridge. The first responders kept pleading and pleading with him to exit and save himself, but he he was one of the catastrophes. Hmm. It was sad. And I'm, sad. I'm on the uh, board of the Greenway Foundation, so in uh, 1973 or 74, Mayor McNichols met with uh, Senator Joe Shoemaker. Mm -hmm. He was the state Senate president. And there was some uh, small amount of funds. <clears throat> so that's eight or nine years after the flood before the real cleanup effort began. And it was started by Mayor McNichols and Senator Joe Shoemaker. The, uh, the Greenway Foundation's website has a, another, I mean, the 
the resources that you all have on there and the, the connections that are made to what started with uh, Senator Shoemaker, Mayor McNichols, that that was that, that could have been another six or seven slides that I just I, right. I, knew I didn't have time for. But for everybody else, uh, check out maybe, uh, sir, you can put the website in the uh, chat so that people know uh, how to or can get onto that resource. Sure. I see that we still have three people or th there's still three hands up. Peggy, are you on there? Can you? Um... You want to uh, give a comment? Well, I wrote something, but I'm not high tech enough to know how to send it. It's on the chat. Press Can return you... or enter. OK. Oh, my gosh. All right, there it is. Thank you. And Ed, did we get you taken care of? Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, although I still remember some other things of all the great pictures Einer, there have to be some great ones are right in Castle Rock, where East Plum Creek undercut the northbound lanes of I-25 so that they were unusable for, I don't know how long it took to repair that, but for, you know, months, almost years, it was a bottleneck going through Castle Rock from the damage from the flood. Mm. I, Ed, I didn't see those photos, but I... I didn't. Uh, I didn't look into the Douglas. You know, some of the Castle Rock or Douglas County yeah. archives. I obviously I have more work to do, but I, I do want to mention. I won't tell you how I know this. I mean, it's not sketchy or anything. It's a longer story than you all need to hear. But there's a professor at University of Denver, uh, William Philpott, I believe. He is writing a book about the 1965 South Platte River flood as we speak. So I would expect that it would become available in the next couple of years. I ended up talking to his daughter and found that out. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that his version is gonna be much more satisfying than my version. Okay, thank you. And, and Gail, do you have a comment? Gail, yeah. is, oh, go, go. <laughs> I was, um... My husband and I were in Boulder that afternoon and evening, and we heard on the radio we could not get back to our home in Littleton because all the bridges were out across the river. And so we stayed overnight with some relatives in Arvada. And then the next day, we had to search for a way across the river to get home. And I believe we crossed the Colfax Bridge, that that was the only one that was available at the next day. I don't know if that's uh, accurate or not, but that was my recollection. And we were, then we saw the, the racetrack when we finally got home, we saw the racetrack destruction and all of the terrible destruction along bowls and so forth. It was a really sad, sad time. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Anyone else want to share a memory before we uh, wrap up our meeting? All right. Well, thank you, Einer. I did notice in the chat that uh, Sarah is also oh, reminding everyone that the June program is about Anne Frank's father. And so we'll be doing that one in June. Uh, as we said, coming up next month, uh, we will be doing Elich's, uh, the past, present, and future. So thank you all for hanging out with us tonight. And thank you, Einer, for the really detailed presentation. It's a topic that I was definitely interested in. And I'm glad that you were able to give such a great uh, discussion about it. And thank also, you. Yes, and thank you, Einer, and thank you everyone for watching. And then this program was recorded and give us a week or two and it should be available on our website as well. And I think what we might do is um, send out this and the uh, last month, the one that Einer did on fires. And he also gave us a really good handout um, uh, last month on, on being safe and prepared. So. Uh, I'll include all of that on an upcoming email to everyone. So this, this same information will be available then if you want to look at the slides again.
So thank you, Einer. Thank you, everybody. Sure appreciate it. You're so welcome. Great. Look Keep forward going. to seeing you all in person next month at Southridge. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thanks.